Washington Journal continues. At our table this morning, Congressman Tom Cole, Republican of Oklahoma, and here to talk about uh, some politics and policy. But before we get to that, let's talk about your, your district. Um, I want to show our viewers this. This is an Associated Press video of the, the latest tornado in Elmore City, Oklahoma. Yeah. That's in your district. That's correct. How are people doing? What happened? You know, they, uh, they're doing well. Obviously, uh, these are always difficult incidents. We had some loss of life. Two people uh, were killed. Uh, certainly some uh, serious damage. Fortunately, most of this was in a very rural area, so it wasn't one of these massive strikes like we had in 2013 in a metropolitan area. Uh, there was uh, I, I, probably our closest call in some ways was a little town called Winniewood, which is a county seat, but uh, a few thousand people, but also a large uh, um, uh, um, oh gosh, a large oil refinery, excuse me. Mm. Uh, and so you always worry that the catastrophic damage would come out of something like that. But again, there, you know, Oklahoma, it's the spring. Uh, this happens pretty much every spring someplace in the state and certainly someplace in the region. Uh, we're awfully good at it and honestly we, we get terrific support. Our, our first responders are excellent. The state and federal authorities always do a great job and uh, these folks are pretty tough. They know how to get through these things. We, we've been to Cushing, uh, Oklahoma, so we saw the, the, the tanks. Yeah, that's massive. That's, a, that's the largest uh, uh, you know, holding complex for petroleum in the United States. So it's, there's literally tens of millions of barrels of oil there at any given time. What kind of economic um, vulnerability does the state of Oklahoma have a to lot. these tornadoes? Well, well uh, tornadoes, uh, you know, they cause a lot of damage where they strike, but it's not like a hurricane. It's not like a Sandy or a Katrina. I mean, the, the bad one in 2013 was uh, you know, on the ground for you know, a few, a little over half an hour, 45 minutes, 17 miles long, mile and a third wide. Now, inside that area, everything is devastated, but, uh, you know, immediately outside, everything's fine. So, again, not like a hurricane or something that uh, can put hundreds of thousands of square miles out. This is uh, a picture of uh, a citizen cleaning up in Texas, but it says in the caption that Oklahoma Governor Mar Mary Fallon declared a state of emergency for 15 counties Tuesday, a day after two people were killed as powerful storm system raked the central United States. Tornado damage was also reported in southwest Kentucky on Tuesday. So. Um, because she has declared a state of emergency for those 15 counties, what does that mean for federal money and federal support? Well, the uh, president still has to sign off on it. The governor is the first person to do it, then it goes to the administration to make a decision. And again, we've always gotten terrific uh, response, uh, regardless of uh, uh, you know the uh, nature of, of the administration, Democrat or Republican. People are sympathetic; they understand things like this happen. So. Uh, you, you immediately are eligible for a variety of loans, a disaster cleanup. Uh, the locality pay, uh, pays part of the burden, uh, but the federal government also pays uh, well over uh, three quarters of the burden. So it's extremely helpful in getting an area back up on its feet. Let's turn to politics now. Uh, the campaign, mm -hmm. uh, Speaker Paul Ryan sat down with the Wall Street Journal yesterday. Here's the headline on the front page. Ryan seeks unity for the Republican Party. Was it helpful, hurtful that Speaker Ryan last week said, I'm not ready to support Donald Trump? You know, Trump. I think probably helpful. I think uh, the Speaker put it pretty well when he said, let's not pretend we're all unified when we know we're not. Uh, but I think this is a very constructive way to go about it. Let's sit down and have a discussion, find points of agreement. We don't expect uh, that everybody in any political party is going to agree on every issue. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think uh, this kind of dialogue, particularly between uh, probably the two most important political figures we have, our presidential nominee and the highest elected Republican in the country, the Speaker of the House, uh, who's in line for the presidency, uh, you know, they need to be working together, they need to be comfortable with one another, they clearly have not had uh, known one another. Uh, but I thought, uh, you know, Mr. Trump's response was pitch perfect, you know, uh, in terms of uh, welcoming that kind of discussion and dialogue and uh, sitting down. And uh, so uh, I expect a productive meeting, a uh, process of uh, getting to know one another and, and figuring out how to work together will probably go on for a while. But at the end of the day, I think they both arrive at the same point. Honestly, they both need one another in the fall. I mean, uh, Paul's main job is to hold the House majority. and. Uh, 
you're not likely to preside over a convention of your nominee and disagree with that or uh, allow a rift to uh, develop between the speaker and a presidential nominee or in a fall campaign. That's just counterproductive to both uh, Mr. Trump's aim, which is obviously to win the presidency, and to Paul Ryan's aim. If it starts this way, though, and as you just said, it goes on for a while, doesn't that weaken the Republicans in the general election? I don't think so. Uh, you know, I think we're all probably pretty shocked that the Republican nominating process is over quicker than the Democrats. I mean, they're still throwing rocks at one another. Uh, and uh, they're still in the middle of campaigns against one another and running ads at one another. And, and uh, so, um, you know, I, I think this stuff's pretty natural. Uh, it was pretty vigorous uh, Democratic primary in 2008. I didn't say that it, it kept people from coming together uh, for uh, then-Senator Obama. Uh, I think the same thing will happen here uh, again. Uh, uh, and, and there's something, you know, deeper uh, at work here. There's clearly major changes going on in the electorate. And I think a common anger, left and right, quite frankly, at Washington, D.C., and what either has or hasn't been done. So, uh, uh, you know, that's, uh, that, that has sort of generated, uh, you know, not only Donald Trump, but Bernie Sanders, who I think is performing much better than uh, most Democrats I know anticipated he would. What's your advice to Donald Trump to get folks like Speaker Ryan and other Republicans who say there are principles that I'm not going to compromise on that make up the Republican Party, and they are concerned that Donald Trump does not share that those same well, principles? I think, uh, I think Donald Trump has to show them himself to be what he is, which is, I think, a work in progress. You know, most candidates change over the course of campaigns. Uh, and I don't mean that in any way. They just learn more. And, and this is the first time candidate at the highest level. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, you're looking for growth. You're looking for maturity. You're looking for inclusiveness. You're looking for somebody willing to, to uh, listen to your point of view. Uh, I think those things are there. I, I mean, I don't think that's going to be as hard to do. And you never can underestimate, uh, you know, frankly, with all due respect, how well uh, Hillary Clinton unifies Republicans. So. Uh, I think it's not going to be hard. The, the choices, uh, you know, come the post-convention period for everybody are pretty clear. You can vote for Hillary Clinton, you can vote for Donald Trump, or you can vote in a third party for what would almost certainly be a losing effort, whether it's on the left or the right. Uh, and uh, your vote's essentially meaningless. Uh, but, uh, each, you know, each American will come to that conclusion. Each political leader has to do it. In the case of uh, Speaker Ryan, um, you know, he does uh, have to think, and I know he does think more broadly because he represents uh, the House majority and literally 240-odd you know, uh, House Republicans, uh, you know, uh, look to him for leadership. So he's got a special responsibility, but he's never done anything except discharge his responsibilities uh, with a great deal of integrity and um, a great deal of effectiveness. So I think he'll do that again. Here's some exit polling from yesterday's uh, Nebraska primary for Republicans, and it jives with other exit polling that we've seen during this primary process. And Trump may be the only active GOP presidential candidate remaining. This is from Politico, but a significant number of Republicans in Nebraska aren't yet comfortable with the idea of Donald Trump in the Oval Office. Nearly four in ten said they would be concerned or scared if Mr. Trump became president. I think most of them would be probably more concerned or scared if Hillary Clinton became president. Uh, so I think once the focus is on, on her, and that's what Republican voters are thinking about, uh, you'll see that they unify pretty quickly. And do you, what is your advice to your fellow House Republicans? I mean, you used to head up the National yeah, Republican yeah. Campaign Committee. So what's your advice to the folks um, who are all up? In November. Well, the first thing is uh, to be prepared yourself, which they are. We haven't lost a single Republican yet in a very volatile primary season. Uh, so, uh, you know, control the things you can control. That is, make sure your campaign is up and operational. Make sure, hopefully, you've kept in touch with your constituents, that they know uh, that you reflect their views and their values. Uh, I think in terms of the presidential, the great majority of them, almost overwhelmingly, will end up supporting the nominee because the majority of their voters will also be voting for the Republican nominee for president. So you don't want that kind of rift. Uh, if in a few cases people feel like they need to do other things out of, out of principle or, frankly, out of political expediency, given the nature of their districts, I think that's perfectly appropriate for them to do. Uh, there becomes an individual decision. But I think, for the most part, most Republicans will end up supporting the Republican nominee. 
Well, Donald Trump will be up on Capitol Hill meeting with the Speaker of the House as well as others in the Republican leadership in both the House and the Senate side on Thursday. David, you're up first in Kentucky. Smith's Grove, a Democrat. Good morning. Welcome. Well, good morning, Gertie. You're doing a good job. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say it can be a good thing. I, I've never heard of a president in my lifetime. I'm, I'll be 66 next Talk the way Donald Trump talks. I mean, he took, he calls Elizabeth Warren goofy. Elizabeth Warren calls Hillary crooked. Hillary, I, I just can't, I just can't understand how in the world we can have somebody. And I like some things he says. I mean, if he could do the things he says he'd do, uh, it's kind of like a lot of the other Republican stuff in my lifetime. <clears throat> They're going to do all this stuff, but they don't ever do it. The national debt goes up under them. Uh, Everything just keeps seem same like the same way. I don't know. I don't understand it. But please comment on where he talks about the name call. It's just that's unbelievable to me. Thank you. Well, it's certainly not my style to to call people names. I don't think it works over the long haul. Uh, but uh, you know, I think uh, right now probably the tolerance for that is considerably higher among the voters because they are mad. They are frustrated, just like you are. Uh, and so, uh, you know, they're they're ready for some pretty rough language. There's been pretty rough language, honestly, uh, from a number of the candidates this time, not just on the Republican side. So, um, you know, I, I can't tell you I particularly like that coarsening of language. It's one of the reasons I like Paul Ryan. I think he's a pretty uplifting, upbeat, Reagan-esque kind of personality. Uh, so uh, hopefully over time we'll get a little bit better. But uh, my, my hopes for that are, are largely centered on the other side of the election. I think it's going to be a pretty rugged election all the way through because people think the country is going in the wrong direction and they really want to shake up Washington, D.C. And they want to do that from the left and the right. Uh, so, you know, the rhetoric in the country has been pretty tough for a long time. And we had a majority leader once called a president of the United States a liar and a loser. That was a Democratic majority leader, Harry Reid, talking about George Bush. So I don't think this is new with Donald Trump. And I don't think it's just on one side of the aisle. But it is something I regret. Kathy in Georgia, Republican, you're next. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Um, Donald Trump certainly is not second or 15th selection. And um, as a 58-year-old uh, woman in Georgia, uh, I'll tell you, it, it's as a matter of conscience, it, it's going to be really hard for me to pull that lever. And I've been a single Republican conservative <laughs> ticket voter my entire life. And uh, it, it's going to be really, really hard. And a lot of it's his language. I don't, I don't think he's, he, I think he's an opportunist. I don't think he's a Republican. I'll vote for every other Republican, but I'm going to have to think more than twice to support him. And I hope sincerely that he'll do a lot of praying and be on his knees when he goes in to talk to Paul Ryan. And uh, I think we need more statesmen in Washington, true statesmen that uh, represent our nation. I'm ashamed to have him represent my country. Congressman, can you respond to that? Well, that's pretty, uh, pretty uh, candid and I think uh, obviously heartfelt uh, observation. And, uh, you know, I can't uh, disagree with anybody that, that's struggling a little bit. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, I look to guys like Paul Ryan and uh, I have a lot of faith in him. And to me, he represents the future of the Republican Party and I hope of the Republic itself at some point. Uh, so you just have to work through these things. I'm heartened that. Uh, uh, the voter, even with this uh, this level of concern, is still going to go vote. Uh, I think that's pretty important for people to do. I actually worry that uh, very negative t campaigns tend to uh, depress turnout across the board. People sort of get disgusted with both sides. Uh, and um, look, I don't think you can affect the process by not participating. So wherever uh, your caller ends up, that's that's appropriate. I mean, she's clearly working this way, this thing through in her own heart and trying to reach the right decision for her country and for her values. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm heartened that she wants to make sure she votes and it's registered. And uh, we'll just let the process work out and uh, she ends up will be the right place for her. It's not just uh, Speaker of the House Paul Ryan, <clears throat> Senator Ted Cruz, who suspended his campaign last week, returned to the Senate. The headline in the Wall Street Journal, a defiant Cruz returns. And it said that um, he refused once again to endorse the party's presumptive non nominee, Donald Trump. He seemed emboldened by his unexpectedly strong showing in the race, not humbled by losing, and showed no interest in being more accommodating to the Washington establishment he campaigned against. 
what would it do for the party if Senator Ted Cruz were to say, I'm supporting Donald Trump, and I want all of my supporters who voted for me to vote for Donald Trump. It would be helpful. Uh, you know, look, he did run a terrific campaign, no question about it. He was the last man standing, uh, you know, uh, other than obviously uh, Trump himself. And uh, look, he's a bright, articulate, able guy. And uh, uh, with, uh, uh, as frankly, Mr. Trump said, a brilliant future. And I suspect uh, he'll weigh, you know, what he thinks, first and foremost, the right thing to do is. I mean, he's a conviction politician, no doubt about that. Uh, but he'll also need to think about his future. And uh, are you better off having played a role in helping Hillary Clinton become president? I don't think so. I don't think most Republicans want to look in the mirror the day after if we were to lose the presidential election and say, you know, I stood on the sidelines or I enabled this to happen. I mean, there goes the Supreme Court. There goes the United States Senate. Uh, we could lose the House in a really bad election. Uh, so I think at the end of the day, again, people have to work through these things. I get it. These are real competitions. They are tough personally. Uh, you know, I've had to do this several times in my political lifetime. I understand. But at the end of the day, uh, you, know, uh, you know, if you're going to be on the Republican ticket, uh, either now or in the future, and not just at the top of it, but on it, I think you ought to be supporting the other Republicans there. You can disagree with them. You can differ with them. Uh, you can certainly, uh, you know, uh, and not be afraid to see the differences. But at the end of the day, your choice is Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. If you're a Republican, for most of us, that'll be a fairly easy choice to make. And according to recent polls that were released yesterday, it could be neck and neck between the two front runners in some swing states. Take a look at Florida. This is Quinnipiac, uh, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. And you can see that right now, these two party front runners are essentially tied. North Charleston, South Carolina. Steve, independent. Hi there, Steve. Yeah, good morning, uh, uh, Congressman Cole. And by the way, don't leave out uh, Michigan and Virginia, who had more uh, uh, Republican turnout in the primaries. They may flip this time. They're traditionally blue. And, and by the way, uh, I want to reiterate, I'm independent. And, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a realist. I know when I go in the booth in, in November and push the button for Darrell Castle of the Constitution Party, that's my way of saying I'm a little tired of the two-party system. Now, I'm a realist, Representative Cole, and you know Oklahoma's going to be red, and you know South Carolina's going to be red. That's a given. That's okay. Uh, I have, you know, we have local and state elections to tend to also. Uh, now, here's the problem. The, the Republican Party obviously seems to be in a state of disarray with so many people, establishment Republicans coming out and speaking out against uh, support of Donald Trump. However, we know that Donald Trump has, has energized people to come out and vote. We know he's really mainly responsible for the record voter turnout, turnout in the primaries. There's a feeling among Trump supporters that there's really not much difference between a Washington Democrat and a Washington Republican, and that's where the problem is. Now, I would like for you to speak to that, but in the meantime, uh, you know, we uh, well, let me speak to the uh, the lack of support by people. You know, we have a, one of your comrades, Mark Sanford, as mm -hmm. down from down here in First Congressional District. He's my congressman. He has vowed not to support Donald Trump. Now, his race is coming up. You know, his his seat's coming up. Jenny Horn, who vows to support him, is going to be running against him. And she gained national attention um, after the Mother Emanuel conflict uh, problem down here that she wanted the, the Confederate flag to come down. So she she's she's pretty popular down here. So, you know, what does this say for the Republicans? Is you know, tell me about this notion that there's not much difference between Washington Democrats and Washington Republicans, and that's what that's why Trump is so popular that he he has an answer to that. Well, actually, there's an extraordinary amount of difference, and. Uh, you can look at any uh, any survey of voting patterns on the House or Senate floor and find that two parties are probably further apart today than they've ever been. I think some of the frustration is we live in a system of checks and balances in an era of divided government. So uh, nobody gets everything they want. Most of the things that people in my area are mad about, where the president's concerned, they actually happened in 19 or in 2009 and and uh, 10 when he had uh, a super majority in the Senate and. Uh, a much bigger majority even than we have today in the House. Uh, and that's where you got everything from Obamacare to the stimulus to Dodd-Frank. Now, if you look at Republicans, they've repealed those things repeatedly, but it's hard to get it past, uh, you know, the presidential veto. Uh, they've also cut the deficit from $1.4 trillion down to, quote, only $430 billion, but that's actually a pretty rapid rise. They saved almost all the Bush tax cuts. 
uh, you know, which all expired uh, while President Obama was in office. And by the way, that's $2,200 more for every person that makes $50,000. So it wasn't just a tax cut for the rich, it was tax cuts for uh, all Americans. Uh, they also got a measure of entitlement reform last year. Uh, so uh, I think we've been fighting the good fight, but at the end of the day, he's one at a time. The other thing that I think is a problem is that uh, there is what I would call an anti-establishment establishment out there today that spends a lot of time trying to convince Republicans the problem in Washington is Republicans. The problem in Washington is Barack Obama if you're a conservative and liberal Democrats. It's not as if uh, they helped us achieve the things I just outlined. Uh, but if you want to get things done, if you want to change on a massive scale, then one party or the, or the other has to control all three branches. And the American people have been a little bit schizophrenic about this. They gave the president, um, you know, a huge victory in 2008, gave him overwhelming control of the House and the Senate. Two years later, took in an unprecedented way, took the House away from him, narrowed the margin in the Senate. Then they turned around and reelected him in 2012. Then they took the House and the Senate away from him in 2014. So that suggests to me a great deal of volatility in the electorate. It also tells me there's a lot of change going on. Most people don't realize that 60 percent of the Republican conference have been elected since 2010. So they can't all be old establishment people. The average age of a United States senator last election fell by 17 years. And again, the chamber changed control. So there's lots of new faces. There's lots of turmoil. I think we're in a, a prolonged period of realignment. And, uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I would just tell people, have a little faith in the American people. They're in a firing mood right now. That's okay. They're right to hire and fire. Uh, and sooner or later, they'll get a combination that they like and they think is working on their behalf. They haven't gotten there yet. But over time, the, the system... Uh, uh, seems to get to where the American people want it to be. I have a lot of confidence in it. Uh, Sarah Palin, former Alaska governor last weekend, thinks that Speaker Ryan is the problem in Washington <laughs> and said that she will work to unseat him because of his comments of not supporting, um, not getting behind Donald Trump right away. His opponent in his, congr in his pr uh, primary, in the primary for his congressional district, also says that he has seen a firestorm of support since Mr. Ryan's comments last week. Mr. Ryan, though, is viewed favorably by 81% of Republicans and GOP-leaning independents who are registered voters in his southeast Wisconsin district and unfavorably by 12% according to a Marquette Law School poll in March. The speaker's wariness of Mr. Trump aligns with sentiment in Wisconsin as well. Well, look, uh, Paul Ryan, uh, his family has lived there for generations. Uh, he's a well-known, well-respected, uh, well-liked, frankly loved figure in his own area. Um, and uh, he's distinguished enough at 45 to have been the vice presidential nominee and the youngest speaker uh, since the mid-19th century. Now that's a heck of a record and I, I'm willing to put all my chips uh, on Paul Ryan uh, in Janesville, Wisconsin as opposed to anybody that's trying to defeat him uh, from either inside or outside the district. Look, the, I think the speaker has been incredibly honest about this. Uh, and I think we should remember something he said. We shouldn't pretend we're unified when we're not. We need to talk through these issues. We need to find common ground. I think that's what he's doing. I think he's leading us, which is what he's supposed to do, uh, toward a unified position. And uh, uh, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. So uh, just bear with him. And uh, I think people, if they watch him operate, will, will know what those of us that have served with him in the House know. Uh, he's a person of great integrity. He's a very thoughtful person. He does the right thing in the end, uh, uh, like almost 100% of the time. I mean, uh, you know, I don't know if he was an Eagle Scout, but he should have been. So uh, I, I just, I'm proud of Paul Ryan, and uh, I respect his leadership, and uh, I think he'll make us a better team in the fall election, and that's what matters. Okay, we'll go to Cleveland, Ohio. Joe, a Republican. Good morning, Greta. Good morning, Congressman. Good morning. I'd like to take a di different perspective here. I'm an 85-year-old person, and I've seen a lot of politicians. But let's take politics out of this for a moment and take a look at the really what the American public is looking at. Number one, I don't know why the Trump uh, uh, people that are backing him aren't putting this out there. Donald Trump has hired more people of diversity than any other person that's ever run for president in my lifetime. He's done more construction. He knows how to talk to the common man, to the tradespeople. He knows how to talk to the educated. He's built golf courses. The people that have been hired there from Hispanics and Asians and African Americans. 
uh, he's also had television experience. The man is extremely knowledgeable, and right now what America is crying for is opportunity to be productive, not political, but production. That's what America is about. The other issue is this, what really disappoints me in the Socialist Party or the Democrats. Every one of the cities that are going through racism and, and murders and the black community and, and are falling apart economically are all Democratic strongholds and cities. And you make some very good points, Congressman. I think this has to really be pointed out. That's why the American public is upset. This man that came into office with the promise of making things better has made it so much worse and has stirred up so much hatred between the races. I have never seen anything as disgusting in my life. And I thank you and truly God bless our country. Congressman? Well, it's certainly um, a very eloquent uh, set of remarks. And uh, look, I think the point that uh, Donald Trump has been an exceptionally successful business guy is that the you know big part of his appeal uh, that he's been outside the political system doing exactly what the caller suggests and that is trying to create jobs, create opportunities. Obviously, he's made himself fabulously wealthy in that process, but he's made a lot of other people rich too, uh, and uh, Americans uh, sort of like that. So I, I've seen no evidence of of discrimination uh, of any type inside of his organization. He seems to be surrounded by a lot of people that really think highly of him, of very diverse backgrounds and points of views. As people point out, he's certainly not a traditional, not much doubt about that. Uh, so, uh, you know, people always say they want somebody that doesn't follow a party line. Here's a guy that doesn't follow a party line uh, quite often. but. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think we'll know a lot more about him even than we know today over the course of a campaign. He's going to be confronted with a lot of questions, a lot of challenges, uh, contradictions. Uh, every candidate goes through this, and particularly candidates at the highest level. So, you know, look, the American people will see both these candidates. They'll make a judgment. They usually make the right judgment. If they make a mistake, they fix it in four years. So uh, just have a little faith in the wisdom of the American voter. They tend to get us to the right place. A couple tweets here. Karen Buchanan says this. For Cruz, at the end of the day, it's a choice of supporting Clinton or the, and then quoting Senator Ted Cruz, pathological liar, narcissist, and serial philanderer. What did you make of... Well, I think, I think the, uh, the tweet, uh, you know, is that makes the point maybe you ought to be careful in your language when you're in political campaigns. Look, uh, you're always going to be confronted. When 17 people were running for the office, 16 of them were going to lose, or the nomination, excuse me. Um, and you're going to be confronted with a choice, and you all signed a pledge. So, uh, you know, I just, uh, I try to be measured, particularly when I'm in contest with other Republicans, because at some point... You're going to either want their friendship if you're fortunate enough to be the nominee or if you want to, frankly, uh, you know, play by the rules of the game, you're going to have to be willing to support the person that the voters of your own party chose. So each candidate has to work through that their, their own way. But the lesson I would draw from this is be awfully careful about the rhetoric. You can be very sharp about issues. Nothing wrong with that. And, uh, you know, we've, we have candidates, if you follow them over their career, you know, at one point Mr. Cruz was saying wonderful things about Mr. Trump. I'm not surprised in, in a pretty hard fought. They were saying pretty tough things about one another. I wouldn't excuse uh, Mr. Trump from this uh, situation. Uh, they each seemed to give as good as they got rhetorically. But at the end of the day, uh, they, they both were going to be confronted with this dilemma, whether either was the nominee or not. Are you going to support Hillary Clinton? Or are you going to rally around the person that the voters of the party that uh, you are a part of uh, chose? And I think you're better off to play, uh, you know, within the rules of the game and accept the verdict of the voters. We'll go hear from Alice, who's a Democrat in Delaware, Ohio. Good morning. I have a question about evangelicals supporting Donald Trump. What, what group could possibly listen to his language and accept that as it being okay for their children to even listen to. That just, that boggles my mind. If you could give me an answer on this, I would appreciate it. <laughs> well, I, I, I would agree with your point. I mean, I wish the language were a little bit different uh, in this campaign. But I'd also put to you, you know, if you're a voter, whether you're evangelical or not, 
you know, why would you support somebody who put American security at risk by having an unsecured server, uh, frankly, breaking her word to the president about that? Uh, why would you support somebody that engineered a very reckless war in Libya that uh, opened up uh, ISIL? Uh, why would you support somebody that did a Russian reset while the Russians are now relitigating the borders of Eastern Europe, projecting power to the Middle East in a way they haven't since the 1970s, and doing loop-to-loops over American planes in the Baltic? Uh, so, uh, look, I think there's a lot more serious issues here than uh, there are going to be sharp differences here. No question about that. It's going to be a hard-fought campaign. Both of these candidates are entering a general election, uh, you know, more unpopular than popular. It's the first time in American history that's ever happened, where they're both upside down, would put it, in popular feeling. And uh, I saw a poll recently, about a third of the electorate can't stand either one of them. And those are drawn from Republicans, Democrats, and Independents. Those people, paradoxically, will probably be the people that decide who wins the election. Because uh, you don't know, are they going to stay home? Are they going to vote for the lesser of two evils? Are they going to change their mind? Are they going to come out uh, and vote you know, one way down ballot and another way? Uh, we don't know that yet. Um, I just know we're better off as, if, if, as many Americans as possible exercise uh, their democratic franchise, go to the polls, and make a choice. Uh, this is going to be a very consequential election. Uh, it certainly will almost certainly shape the Supreme Court for a generation. Uh, control of the Senate is at stake. And I think in an election this, this volatile, control of the House is also at stake. Uh, so, um, you know, if you like the 09 and 010, uh, you may want to vote Democratic. Uh, you know, if you'd like to really change the system here, you know, I think you're probably better off opting for Trump than somebody who says I'm running for a third term of President Obama. That's the way, it, you know, in some ways it's a change status quo election, and Hillary Clinton is very much the status quo candidate. She's positioned herself that way, and, uh, you know, I think the country needs to decide do you want to change directions. Uh, I saw something like this kind of change when I was much younger in 1980, and you remember how close it was between uh, uh, Carter and Reagan right up, and there was a Republican split, and John Anderson was running as an independent, and my gosh, could you, the American people woke up the day before the election, or a couple of days before, and said, hey, we have double-digit interest rates, double-digit uh, inflation, rising unemployment, the Russians are in Afghanistan, heck, I'll try the cowboy, you know, and uh, uh, they did, and they liked what they got, and they got change. Uh, so, I don't know if this is the same parallel, but I think it's the same kind of volatility. We'll go to Florida. Richard, independent, you're on with Congressman Tom Cole. Go ahead. Yes, good morning, Greta. Good morning, uh, Representative Cole. Uh, the people have spoken. They want Donald Trump. Uh, if Ryan can't get on board, he needs to resign. And, and Representative Cole, you were talking about when uh, the Republicans took the House and the Senate. Well, when they took the House, uh, Speaker Boehner, said that he was going to secure the border, which he didn't do. He was going to defund Obamacare, which he didn't do. He said he was going to cut the budget $100 billion, which he did not do. What this, These two parties are basically one party, and their overall objective is to keep the power away from people. We are fed up with a the government that is run basically by attorneys that try to convince people that right is wrong, wrong is right, good is bad, bad is good. They talk, they talk out of both sides of their mouth and, and uh, say the same thing. Okay, Richard, let's have the congressman respond. Should Speaker Ryan resign if he can't get behind Donald Trump? Absolutely not. First of all, I think he will, so I'm not going to speculate about something that hasn't happened. But look, he's, he's the chosen leader of the members of the House of Representatives. The voters he's accountable to are the voters in his district. The members he's accountable to who make him speaker are all up here representing different districts. Uh, we have a high degree of confidence in him, and I think he's working to get us to the right place. I do want to take issue uh, with the caller on a couple of points. So John Boehner did cut the budget, by the way, by $100 billion. Matter of fact, if you go back and look, the deficit's down on an annual basis over a trillion dollars. Uh, he also, we're spending less money than we did in 2008 in the appropriated budget, and that's what the caller was talking about. It's entitlements that didn't get reformed, and that's what's driving most of the government spending today. Uh, in terms of these other commitments, look, I've known John Boehner, with all due respect, the caller, probably a lot better than he has. He never made any claim that he could.
secure the border. He controlled one third of one, excuse me, one half of one third of the American government. He didn't have the presidency. He didn't have the Senate almost every day he was speaker. And yet he lowered the deference. He got permanent tax cuts for everybody, including the caller. Uh, he got some entitlement reform. He left us with the largest majority since 1928. So it's a record he can be pretty proud of. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, you can't promise what the Senate's going to do, let alone what the President of the United States is going to do. If you want the kind of change that the caller talked about, you needed to win the 2012 election. We didn't win every election. We got the majority in the House. We kept it in 2012, which was pretty amazing given the scope of the president's victory, over 5 million votes, and built on it and then got the Senate. Uh, we've sent down to the president the repeal of Obamacare this year. He vetoed it. Uh, we sent down to him uh, barring Planned Parenthood funding. He vetoed it. Waters of the U.S., he vetoed it. Keystone Pipeline, he vetoed it. Suggests to me the problem isn't what Congress is doing from the point of view of the caller. It's the fact that the president has a different point of view. And in our system, he has the right to veto legislation. We don't have the votes to override it. It'd be a lot easier if we had a president at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue working with us instead of in opposition to us. But again, that's the verdict of the American people. The president got elected fair and square. Congress got elected fair and square. But they are of different parties and different points of view. Let's try to get in two more calls, if we can. Jackie in Lawrenceville, Georgia, Democrat. Hi, hi, Representative Cole. Hi. Hello. How are you this morning? Very good, thank you. Good. I just have one question. Um, my question is, if Republican policies are so great, then can you tell me why all red states are the poorest states in the nation? Well, I don't think all red states are. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, we have 31 governors, I think, right now. I don't think they're the 31 poorest states uh, in the country. Uh, so you know, we're successful in lots of different parts of America. Uh, I mean, Massachusetts, for goodness sakes, has a Republican governor right now. So, uh, again, with all due respect, I just disagree with your premise. Diana, Fort Belvoir, Virginia, Republican. Yeah, um, I have a question in regards to if someone's looking into Donald Trump's financial standing, because it just seems someone that uh, talks about so much money that he has it just seems that he really wasn't spending too much money when he's been going um, and running for president. He doesn't really go out to eat. He's not staying at hotels. He's flying back home. And then this whole thing with Trump University. Um, I mean, if, if he really is elected and he is prosecuted for that or he's found guilty of doing wrong, um, a fraud, I mean, can he stay president? So I just wonder if people are really looking into his financial standings and if that could impact him, because I certainly um, do not want a president that is a fraud. Well, there's only one candidate that's involved in an FBI investigation right now, and it's Hillary Clinton, not Donald Trump. But to your point, uh, believe me, there is enormous scrutiny underway by both sides of, of every penny that's being spent, everything that's being done. There's been opposition research done by uh, both parties here. Uh, and uh, believe me, the, the FBI, last time I heard anyway, had over 200 members associated with their public integrity section that looks at politicians, particularly Congress, but uh, also the presidential candidates. So if there's something wrong out there, there's a pretty good chance it's going to be exposed, as it should be, and people will be held accountable. Before you go, sir, Rock Dots tweets in, I refuse to believe that the last sane Republican, Tom Cole, would pull the lever for Donald Trump. <laughs> Well, look, I said at the beginning of this process, I would support the nominee of my party. Uh, I, you know, I, I try to respect everybody in the process. I certainly respect uh, uh, Secretary Clinton, but I don't agree with her. I didn't, didn't think she was a good secretary in terms of the outcome. Uh, you know, we obviously disagree policy-wise. I've seen her move further and further to the left as she's chased Bernie Sanders in this campaign. Well, let me ask you, though, sir, since sure. we're running out of time, uh, you were also one that supported this idea of a contested convention and having possibly Speaker Paul Ryan be the nominee. Is that dream dead? I think pretty much so. <laughs> I think, uh, look, first of all, Paul Ryan didn't want to ever do that. Uh, but second, look, my point's always been, until you have the majority of the delegates, you're not the nominee. You know, close doesn't count. It's not horseshoes. you got to get it, uh, the number. Uh, but with no, uh, no uh, opposition uh, in the field, uh, you know, Trump won two states last night. Uh, no reason to think he won't sew this up on the 7th, if not before, 7th of June in California. So, 
uh, you know, I think uh, he is the presumptive nominee at this point. He's less than 40 votes shy. Thank you, sir. Thank you. For being here.